Thank you everyone for joining me today to the Microsoft 365 virtual marathon. Uh, today we are going to be speaking about collaboration from the trenches and how to build out some of your internal communities with teams. We're going to cover a lot of information. Um, we'll give you a couple tips and tricks and cover some of the limitations you might run into along the way. My name is DRC Hess and I am an Office Apps and Services MVP with um, Cloudway. So just to a, a quick reminder to mark your calendars uh, coming in March to Las Vegas back at the MGM Grand Resort. We will have the Microsoft 365 collaboration conference. Um, we will also be presenting there. So if you are interested in the wide world of Teams and SharePoint, uh, this is the conference for you. Um, please come out and join us. Um, please feel free to tweet this session at any time. Um, if you like it, you know, we'd love to hear more um, about feedback later. If you'd like to reach me regarding any content or any questions after this presentation, please feel free to reach me by email, my blog, or through LinkedIn as well, or Twitter. All right. So let's get started. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is we want to understand what Microsoft Teams is, um, what it's used for, and what we're going to be using it for today. Um, there's everything from highly technical aspects of Teams all the way to the end user scenarios, and it ranges across a wide array of application and line of business uses. Today we're going to be focusing on our users and the best way to help grow adoption from within your organization. We're going to talk a little bit about the architecture. It's important to understand where things live, how to get to them, and in case they accidentally disappear on you, um, where you can also go find them later for retention as well. Um, we're going to cover a little bit about governance and making sure you know where those bumper guide rails are going to be and some of the customization capabilities in case you need to extend out the capabilities of teams to meet your needs moving forward. Okay. So Microsoft Teams is meant to be the hub for teamwork. It really is built by Microsoft to be that communication gap that we didn't have in SharePoint. Um, it allows us to collaborate in new ways through chat, through videos, through you know integrated Teams information. Um, there's a lot of ways that we didn't have in the past that we now have as a part of this. Uh, we have the ability, just like any of the other applications within Microsoft stack, to be able to customize and extend the capabilities to match our line of business needs as well as um, you know any custom applications that we may need or workflows, anything like that. And goal is to be able to provide a confident workspace for your employees where they're going to understand how to use it. It's intuitive and they're going to be able to able to easily adopt without a ton of training um, while still being able to be within compliance standards, manageable through IT and provide the security level both from a desktop and mobility stance for all of your users. So there's three phases that are going to come into play when you're thinking about creating any internal community. One, you have to understand how to get started and what your initial steps need to be. Then we're going to talk about how you experiment and the length of that experiment, who should be involved in it, and how you're going to think about that initial pilot program when you roll it out, and then how to scale that pilot program back out to the rest of your organization. So let's talk about getting started. Okay. There's three primary roles that I want you guys to think about whenever you are talking about technology in your organization. And this can apply to Teams very heavily, but it can apply to SharePoint or any other program that you're really trying to introduce into your organization. The first person is going to be that executive sponsor. This is the person who from the organization is going to be your primary stakeholder. They either are the ones who authorize the budget for it or they have the largest um, piece to be able to be gained through helping employees be more efficient and get more out of a platform. They're often a CIO level role, maybe a CTO um, level, but they're going to be the person who's going to say yes or no to being able to authorize 
team's use within your organization. Um, and they're a very, very important person to have on your side. The next person that we want to talk about is your program manager or kind of your mid-level stakeholder. And this is the person who would actually drive the initial project of rolling out teams. So the ones who are going to be having those meetings um, with the project managers, with your initial team members, with IT to help coordinate everything. And they're really going to drive the, the initial adoption plan throughout this organization. This could be the leader of a specific business such as comms. Um, it could be someone from HR. Um, but that person really needs to both have a little bit of technical knowledge as well as the driving force to help people get to a goal. OK, and then the last group that we want are your champions. Champions are kind of hard to identify because champion is not a role inside. It's not a formalized role inside of an organization. But what it is, is it's really those people who pick up technology really fast. They understand it and they have vision to be able to see how it can be used to solve business problems. Most of the time, this is that power user who everyone goes over to their desk. Wait, when we were allowed to still go to desk <laughs> and we'll ask some questions about, you know, how do I? And that person is going to be that person at those lower levels, really driving adoption from the bottom up. So while you have the executive sponsor saying, yes, we are going to roll this out at the same time, you have your champions at the bottom that are helping engage the actual users of the platform to drive adoption from the bottom up. OK, so we have three kind of layers of architecture. Um, at a base level within teams. OK, the first one is understanding what is actually a team. A team is think of it as a large container. It contains the ability to do chats. It contains the ability to hold meetings. It contains these things called channels within it, but it is that large container. OK, it's a collection of people and tools used towards a common purpose. That is what a team is and it gets more interesting when you're talking about which teams are using this team inside of that team and the team's nomenclature, <laughs> but just understand that it is kind of that starting ground at the highest level of architecture that you're going to have within teams. Okay. From there we go one level down to what channels are. And channels are really that individualized space inside of a team for either separated workflows or separated roles. Um, a good example is this, if you have a, team, a, a development team, for example, in that, that development team, you might have phases of a project. So if your team is for a specific project, you might have you know, one channel for phase one, a channel for phase two, um, channel for QA and maybe a channel for like the business analysts who are not the developers so that conversations can be channeled more towards their specific audience instead of being a fire hose for the entire team. We'll talk a little bit about how the permissions come into play later and making sure that the content ends up in the right hands. And then we have private channels. Private channels are something that was recently released only a few months ago and what these private channels are are really for conversations that are just a subset of the team. In order to be part of a private channel, you have to already be a member of the team. So what this is is taking some of the members um, and creating a private area that is just for them. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of what private channels can do for you in just a little bit. OK. So to create a team, we want to know when is the right time to create a team and maybe who should think about doing that. So anytime you need to collaborate on a project, anything that has a life cycle um, is a great opportunity to spin up a new team and hold the content there, hold your conversations there in an area that is engaging for your users, as well as being able to have all of that knowledge stored in a singular location. Um, the worst part that we ever had about collaboration in the past was we'd have a conversation at the water cooler with one person. We'd go somewhere else and by the time we translated that conversation, it was like playing telephone and the right information never came across correctly. 
Teams offer that ability for everything to happen in a singular location. So meeting notes can be taken, the video of a conference can be taken, um, your chats can happen. And what it does is it allows for a history to build up of that project and the conversations that took place in real time um, for all of the team members to be able to take advantage of that content. OK. Where these are great is when the audience is what we call topic focused. So a project or maybe you have a walking group at lunch or a training group. These are not meant to be your fire host conversations like Facebook. Um, these are really meant for that a targeted audience to help you be productive and get work done. Okay. Which brings us to, you know, when should you create a channel? So you have your team, you have you know, we'll say 30 people in your team. Great. Where do you go from here? People are going to be working on different work streams in that team. You might have a couple people who are developers, a couple people who are business analysts, a few people who are your IT pros potentially, and they're all working on different things and need to have conversations with each other that may not be relevant to everyone, but everyone can still see those conversations. Uh, this is important for when you would create a channel. It's just segregating out the work streams into more manageable pieces. It's where you would actually get your work done. OK. And our special snowflake, the private channels. So private channels, like we said, were re were introduced a few months ago. They were one of the highest recorded ask on user voice. Now, with great power comes great responsibility. And here's where you will have to make a vital decision within your organization is to allow private channels or not. When you create a private channel, you get a couple extra things with it. You get a new site collection, an entirely separate site collection on the back to store all of your documents in, um, in your content. So when you would create a regular team, it provisions an Office 365 group, which means you get planner, you get, you know, the email address, you get, you know, your SharePoint site, you get all these things that come with it. But the private channel, you don't. You get that that private area, and that is because it's a security layer because the way that teams work when everybody is a team, the permissions are assigned at the team level. In order to break that apart, to give you a private area, they literally have to create an entirely separate site collection container to be able to separate out your content based on those permissions. So when you go to archive it, the archive team will also archive the content from the private channel as well. So for the IT admins in the audience, you're going to be OK. <laughs> um, but it is a little bit confusing. If you're a member of a team and you're also a member of that private channel, how to navigate the world going back and forth between the, the documents in one and the documents in another and understanding the permission levels on those can be a little bit confusing. So you're just going to want to make sure that, hey, am I creating this private team for the right reasons or is there enough content and enough conversations happening that maybe I should create a private team instead of a private channel? Just things to consider as you guys move forward. So with any rollout, trying to decide what goes first is always going to be a priority. And it's a recommendation that you create a few types of teams first to help you get started. And these become kind of your pilot teams. You're learning, testing out things and slowly rolling it out before you just let it loose to the wild of the organization. So for the, re the recommended teams that I would recommend you create from scratch would be the getting to know teams. This would kind of become a training area later on. You know, how do I get started? You know, how do I log in? Um, can I use the web app? Do I need to log in with my phone? Is the authentication different? Um, how do I create a meeting? Those basic kind of feature related conversations and questions that users are going to have. Uh, you as administrators might have as well. And it's a way to help you guys gain initial feedback on things that might become an issue with the organization when you roll it out so that you can be proactive and be able to address those things as you guys start your rollouts later. 
the second team I want you to think about is a team's implementation. And this is going to be the actual team that you're getting together to actually create that team's rollout project. So you maybe your initial developers, if they're creating line of business applications, uh, the, those stakeholders that we talked about, your early adopters, maybe those, you know, first few champions, those are going to be the people we want inside of that team because the, the strategy and planning and thinking about your security and compliance, um, you know, how you're going to engage the business and the change management scenarios. That is a great opportunity for that team to be used um, to hold those conversations and be able to locate them later for, for use when you're ready to implement. Okay. Third one is going to be teamwork champions. This one is kind of the third one created after you initially get, you know, what you want your security to be and what you want your governance to be. Because then what you're going to do is you're going to teach these champions, these power users who are just amazing within your organization, the best practices. You're going to teach them what those guide rails are and how Teams is to be used within your organization to drive adoption and fix business processes. Okay. They're also the group that you want to be able to gather feedback and support from. Some of these bullet points, they aligned with what you would be channels within that team. Ways to help get feedback from people. Um, figure out who your program leads are. Um, how are these champions going to report things back? It's a way to, for you to help figure out some of the use cases and be able to kind of do test runs with some of your best power users. And the last team I want you to think about is support. And the reason why I say support should be a team is because you have to train people from help desk on how to support teams when users have questions. Uh, you, end users are going to you know, need a way to be able to contact people or get information from the right people. And you want to make sure that they're getting a consistent message. So how are you going to support the rollout with, within teams um, at your organization? These are the first few teams I feel are the most important. Uh, Feel free to run with them, um, use them, or even tell me some of your own ideas. I'd love to hear them. Okay, so now that you've defined, you know, what your teams are, you know what a team and a channel and a private team and private channel are, now it's time to actually start your experiment. And your experiment really is that driving force where we are going to start implementing this within your organization. So there's about six steps to start thinking about in this and hopefully you've done part you'll be having these conversations within those first four teams that you've created first one create that champions program you might have those couple initial champions that were part of the the initial testing and everything like that but now you need to roll it out to a larger scale uh, maybe that first department or the first two or three departments that you guys are going to initially roll teams out to to kind of to create it make sure those champions know what the governance policies are so that the they're not recommending something that goes against um, what you want them to be able to do and give them an opportunity to relay that content to other members of the organization. Second part is creating your governance plan. OK, governance is the buzzword of the century. It can mean so many things, but at the end of the day, it means how do we enable our users to get their jobs done without them risking security and compliance within our organization. That really is what, what governance is. It is that guiding set of rules of how you are going to use teams to within your business. The, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to create a governance plan um, and who should be a part of it and how you can have a living governance um, site within your organization that can help you kind of move forward with some of those questions. Third way is to define your use cases. Why are you rolling out Teams? Is it to replace a calling feature? Is it to replace the line of business system that you already had? Is it because Microsoft is getting rid of Skype for business and you just need to move to the newest version of whatever you're using for voice and meetings? Um, what are your use cases? Because if you don't know what you're going to use it for, then you don't know how to help users and guide users towards an outcome. What do you want to achieve? Okay. Number four is who are your early adopters? Generally, your early adopters are going to be those champions. Um, 
they also could be people who are just really good at being the, the you know, we'll call it the test rabbit in this case. They are really good at just having things thrown at them and being able to figure it out and figure out even new ways to use things. Uh, they are a great per, a group to initially roll things out to because they usually provide great feedback that you can use for the scaling of this um, platform later on. Okay. And speaking of feedback, how are you going to get feedback back from users? Do you want to do it through the team? Are you going to set up a Microsoft form to elicit feedback and have it go to a list? Um, are you going to have, you know, weekly office hour calls? How, determine the best way on how to get feedback and know that people enter feedback in different ways. If it's a 15 step form, they're probably not going to spend the time to do it. If you want real feedback, provide different areas um, in different ways to get that feedback back from your users and make sure that you're not just taking feedback from just management or just end users. You really want to make sure the feedback you receive is all around experiences. Okay. And the last one is making sure that you get your support staff on board. Like anything that we roll out to organizations, if you can't support it afterwards, then there's a problem. So make sure that you know, whoever your support staff is, um, that they're trained in teams, that they understand different scenarios that you know quite often happen. They may even have a checklist of some of those things um, to be able to understand what they are, like some of the maybe the limits within teams. So that people, if they call and say I have a problem, they're already potentially going to have to know the answer and know, or at least know where to look to find it. Okay. So what is involved in a champions program? OK, one of the things that we've used in the past at different organizations and you can go about it two different ways is you can create a team site within um, within SharePoint and you can share information there um, or you can create a team Team, if you have, uh, you know, less than, uh, you know, the specific team limits, you can add all of those members to a team and they can kind of talk and gather feedback from each other there. Or if you find that you have a very large organization, say 70,000 people in a pharmaceutical company, this is where you might also bring in Yammer as an example um, for the Champions program. At the end of the day, what you want to do is provide an area where they can collaborate, talk to each other, share examples, and be able to get answers to help them engage with the rest of your organization. Okay, we want to empower them to be able to train people. Okay, and make sure that you have positive reinforcement for these people. Like these are the guys to really drive um, the usage within your organization. So find ways to kind of you know help be nice. Um, you know, sometimes like games can be really fun, uh, you know, little Starbucks gift cards for, you know, person who answer the most questions. Um, it's a way just to kind of help people both gain value, understand that they're valued so that they provide more value to the rest of the organization. And make sure that you have a plan on how to execute uh, that champions program. So think about the steps of like, who do you want to invite to it? Who are your champions? Which platform do you want to use to host it on? How do you plan on getting feedback from them? And how are you going to implement the feedback and give responses back to them regarding it? Governance. Very big thing. So a couple of the big governance questions, and there are so many more. We could have an, an entirely new session about this. Um, you want to know who can create teams within your organization. I've worked with some companies where they open free or um, you know non IT led uh, self service creation where anybody can create a team. You know if they're working on a project or they want to do something, they can spin one up on their own. Uh, other organizations like to lock that down where it's what we call IT led, which means that IT has a request system that they take the request and they provision the team for you. Uh, there's several different options, but you need to make sure for your organization that you choose the right one. OK, teams naming conventions. This is really important because you some of the big ones you might want to create might be departmental teams right away. So if you're rolling this out, think about provisioning those teams first 
so that you have the URL and you have the name so that someone else later doesn't create, you know, finance team and it's actually really not for all of finance or not the same purpose as what you would want it to be later on. So think about some of those options you go through. Just a couple quick reminders that a team cannot start with uh, an underscore or a period and it cannot end with a period. Those are not allowed. So if you're going to think about naming conventions, make sure you don't add those in there. OK. Guest access. Guest access is when you have individuals who are invited from other organizations within your to join in your tenant to be a part of your team. That is different than external access where you are federated. OK, so if you're inviting guests in, determine what they should have access to. Um, who is going to be the person that has to make that request? Because it's generally going to be someone who has to flip that switch inside of the admin center to be able to do that. So determine, are you going to allow guest access um, or even federated external access within your organization? Okay. Applications and apps. Teams has the ability to integrate with some amazing apps through the connectors that are available to you and you can even build your own. However, some apps may not be relative to your company. Some apps may cost additional funding. Your IT admin is going to be the person um, working with senior management to determine which apps should be approved. Now, the last thing that I want anyone here to do is automatically start off with going, well, until we know everything, we must turn off all of our apps. Please don't do that because there are apps like Office apps. So you have PowerPoint and you have Forms and you have Word and some of those things that people really need. We want to make sure that we don't accidentally turn those off for users. So carefully consider what apps might be valuable for your teams first and, and add them, but make sure you don't turn them all off as a default just to be on the safe side. Okay. Are meetings included? OK, depending on what kind of licensing you have, you're, you might have meetings that are not included in the way that you want, or you might have to purchase call minutes. So to know what kind of license you have, this is really going to be that IT pro IT admin question um, in, in collaboration with the executives to determine what licensing you have, what part, what is your tenant and is it included? And if so, you know, do you guys need to test and think about the quality of the meetings that you guys are having? What you'll often find, especially like right now when everyone has to go remote, is that you're starting to, to run into issues with bandwidth. You know, do you have enough bandwidth to to hold the meeting in the first place or to have that call or to be able to add video? Um, now that custom backgrounds are allowed um, inside of Teams, that requires a specific um, level of bandwidth to be able to, to take um, advantage of that functionality. So think about some of the things that are directly related to your infrastructure um, as well in this um, in order to be able to support it. Do your are your laptops updated? Um, I'll tell you I was on a forum the other day and, and someone was using a, a Windows 7 laptop and wondering why they couldn't use Teams. Make sure that your IT admins, um, you know, and and you as a business user are informed about what you need to be able to make certain functionality work. Um, including your infrastructure, not just the platform itself. Okay. And the last piece of the governance I really want you to think about is the length of this experiment. So you're rolling out teams. That's great. You've chosen your first maybe three departments to roll it out to and really gain feedback and test it and find the best answers. Is there anything you need to adjust? Um, that can't roll on for a year. And that really needs to be a defined time frame before you say, OK, now we are going to expand it and roll it out to the rest of our organization. So define it and define what your goals are. What do you want to get out of that period of time um, before you start scaling it out to everyone? Okay. So what guest, guest access are? We talked about this just a little bit. So guest access is enabled in the Teams Admin Center. You have to be at least a Teams Admin to be able to do it. You can also be a global admin. Uh, they can be granted uh, access to existing Teams or channels within Microsoft Teams. Again, these are specific users. This is not a give access to people from a domain like anyone from Microsoft. 
This is individual users, okay? And the, at, the Teams admins are allowed to control which features guests can and cannot use. Are they allowed to start meetings? Are they allowed to create meetings? Are they allowed to, you know, create channels? Um, all of that is going to be controlled through the admin center. Um, regarding these specific individuals as well, what kind of per permissions that user is going to have. Okay. Ex external access. So where guest access is individuals, external access is like adding another company being able to find you. It's kind of like doing that Google search. If, you know, if I if I went into Teams and try to start a conversation with someone from Microsoft or someone from your organization, it's giving me the ability to, to have their name come back with a possible status. That's what external access is. It's allowing that federated access um, outside of your organization to allow people to find you. OK, so again, that's also configured through the Teams Admin Center. Uh, they do not get access to teams or teams resources. That has to be something that they will, you know, be specifically given permission to, but by default, they don't just because they can find you doesn't mean they have access to all of your content within your organization or within your tenant. It's really important. OK, so if, if I was to allow, say, someone from Microsoft.com domains, they can find me, they can create a chat with me, they can call me or set up a meeting, but they do not have access to my teams or channels within my org. OK, and by default, all external domains are allowed. Um, you can choose a couple options. So if you choose to allow specific domains, that means that you are literally cutting off everybody else and only allowing people from those specific domains to be able to contact you. Like say I want to block all external access except for people from Microsoft with a Microsoft.com domain. Then only people within Microsoft can contact me besides people in my own organization. Okay, it means that nobody else would be able to find me. So if I was from Contoso.com, they're not going to be able to look and find me at all. OK, that is the difference between allowing domains. Now, if you're blocking domains, that is the exact opposite scenario. What blocking domains means is that anybody can find me. So Contoso or Microsoft or Staples as an example, everybody can find me except for maybe Contoso. That is blocking a specific users from a specific domain to be able to contact me. Um, or find me from Teams, OK? So it's important to understand those two options between allowing domains and blocking domains. Okay. So some of our use cases, you know, pretty important things here. You know, we want to know what kind of Office apps we want to enable. So like those, you know, Word, PowerPoint, you know, Excel, those really important things that everybody uses all the time. We want to be able to talk about like, you know, is the goal to be able to have conversations with the te teams and channels? Um, you know, is the ability to talk to each other one of those use cases we want to be able to cover? You know, do you want to determine if you want to have pinned apps to a specific area? Pinned apps could be, you know, what you see on that left hand side of teams. Um, things like planner over there, or if you want Yammer to be pinned there, your calendar, those are all pinned applications um, that are available to you through there. OK, uh, we want to make sure that documents are easily accessible. So your files tab is something that's going to be super important to you. And a really good thing to always make sure it's turned on inside of that document library is document versioning, because as you create new documents or new versions of it, you want to make sure that you can so, you know, either revert back to an older version if needed, or at least understand that versioning is available to you. One of the other use case scenarios is we want to empower people. OK, we want people to be able to, to effectively rule their world and get their job done the way that they are the most efficient. And people work different ways. So the one size fits all isn't always going to be the best solution, but Think about the ability that they can use different apps to take notes. You can do meeting notes directly in the team or you could use OneNote. You know, if I want to have a, uh, I can do a one on one chat. I could chat, you know, invite the entire channel to it. I could use a call instead. I could do a recorded meeting. I could do a live event. The ability to 
use this platform in the way that makes you most comfortable to get your work done and achieve more is by allowing that and understanding what your users want to do. So we want to empower users at the end of the day to make good decisions and help get their jobs done. And the last use case that we're going to definitely run into is the ability to extend it. Oftentimes in technology, especially in, in Microsoft technologies we may have used in the past, we often come across things that were like, yes, this is great, but could it dot dot dot? Or, you know, can I dot dot dot? Uh, these kind of things are where we have the ability to extend it, either through external third party applications using connectors or even building our own line of business applications. And so we want to know what those capabilities are and maybe be able to weigh the options of how to achieve the outcomes that we're looking to get um, within our organization. Okay, so what business scenarios do you have? This is a little guide to kind of help you get there, right? So if we think about it, you know, as someone in a consulting role within finance, Maybe I want to create a new finance report. You know, I want to use Excel or Power BI or Word. And I know I'm successful when I can create that document, I can upload it, everyone can edit it, and my manager can see it for their meeting the next day. Those are going to help you to find your use cases per role or per department, and maybe uncover some things that you didn't think about um, in the initial rollout. Okay, so you use these for different people in your departments at different levels, both the end users, power users, your IT admins, um, maybe even your executives as well. All right. Next up, we're going to onboard our early adopters. We are going to get these guys working and trying things out and just let the good times roll because that's really what's going to happen. Uh, the first step to get them on board is you need to send them an email. <laughs> Funny, right? Because you know, you're know you inviting everyone to an, a platform to help get rid of email, and yet we're sending them an email. Say la vie. But you have to invite them into the community because just because you roll Teams out doesn't mean people know how to get to it or even find it or open it or even know what Teams they're a part of. So we want to make sure they get that email invitation. We're going to invite them into there. Um, a good thing to do is hold a host kickoff. So just like any project, you'd have a kickoff call with everyone. Have a kickoff with your early adopters. Explain why you guys are rolling out teams, why it's important, how you want people to help. You know, you make the organization organization successful with the rollout of this platform um, within the org. OK. Make sure you solicit feedback. This is not a, I am just telling you what is going to happen here. This is that, hey, we are a team and we want to work together as a team to make this successful. Make sure that they feel like they have buy-in because they do. They're the ones who are helping drive the adoption. So we want to make sure that you have them with the tools that they need to succeed, the information on how everything works, and the guidelines from the governance plan on what rules they have to stay in line in as they're moving forward. And then just make sure to touch base with them periodically and make sure if they've got questions, um, they have a way to get those answered. Some of the things that you can do um, would be one, having a living governance site um, on a SharePoint site, um, you know, with generic how to's, questions, documents, maybe some videos that you took. Another way is by hosting a weekly office hours call. You know, maybe one hour a week, you just open it up to anybody in the org and say, hey, does anyone have questions? This is your time for me to personally kind of help you um, and figure out, figure things out. Um, it's a way to help gauge feedback in a non-formal process that makes people feel comfortable and engaged. Okay, talk about some of those feedback channels. So, funny part about teams, right? If you have under 5,000 people, you know, it's okay to use a single team for it. Now, teams limits did just get raised to 10,000. So, that is a new number that is out. So, if it's under 10,000 people now, you can technically have them be a member of a team and you can solicit feedback that way. 
What happens if you have an org over that 10,000? I apologize now, but you're probably going to want to look for another application. In this case, most likely Yammer. Um, and the reason why is there are member limits on how many members a team can have. There are not those limits currently on Yammer. So while this is a team's presentation, know that there are other options to help you achieve specific goals um, that you may not be able to do at this time um, within, within Teams itself, okay? So your support staff, what are some of the things that they need to know, right? Um, I've included a couple resources here. You can, you know, get this deck later and be able to go click on them. But the most important thing is they need to have a foundation in Microsoft Teams. They need to understand basic functionality and configuration. They need to understand how to troubleshoot different things. What happens when a user comes to them and says, hey, I'm getting this thing called poor, poor call quality or my need meetings won't start or my audio won't start. How do you work through those different things um, that are available to them? Uh, there are there is a known set of issues um, that are out there regarding teams. It's always great to go check on there and see if someone from the product team already knows about it. Um, there's you know webinars out there and then there's also even a course if you want to be able to help send your your IT admins out and they can study and then also take the new IT um, IT administrator exam for Teams, the MS700 exam. So there's a lot of uh, capabilities at different levels to help get your support staff up to speed and also keep them in the loop as, thing, as time moves on. Okay. And the next step we have is to scale Teams out. So we've already talked about how you get started. We've talked about your experiment and that initial rollout to a limited audience. What are some of the things to think about as we bring it out to the rest of the organization? Okay, we want to define our outcomes. Notice I didn't say use cases. By this point, you already know what your use cases are. By this point, you want to know what you need to achieve. Okay, from both an organizational standpoint, cultural, individual, and tangible capability. Okay. Rolling out a new platform with any organization, you're always going to have a little bit of resistance to change, especially if you're a, uh, an organization that's been using Slack um, and you're deciding to move to Teams because it's a better fit, better capabilities, you know, whatever your reasoning, you know, users can often be resistant to change. So how do you help manage some of those cultural changes as well? Okay. So from an organizational standpoint, some of the things we want to think about are the cultural transformation. We really want to build a culture around Microsoft technology. It's not just about Teams. It's about SharePoint and Microsoft 365 and maybe Office Pro Plus and Windows 10 and the whole thing. How does the entire ecosystem come back to provide a better set of services for your organization? Okay. Do having those services and you know kind of that one stop shop help improve employee retention, therefore saving the company money? Uh, does it allow you to recruit new employees? You know, if I was using SharePoint 2010, would I be able to recruit people who were experts in Office 365? You know, they're probably not going to want to go work on old technology. It's a way to help, you know, kind of hang that carrot out of, hey, we are on the forefront of what we do and we want to be there to help drive success. Um, social engagement, also operational agility, your ability to change um, and that change management scenario are all going to be things as part of the organization. How, what do you want to achieve as part of these? What's your goal? From a cultural standpoint, employee sentiment. There, I'm pretty sure there has never been a time where something has been rolled out at an organization where someone didn't have some positive and also some less than positive feedback regarding either the application itself or how it was rolled out or the I hate underscore, you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> um, it's important to hear that feedback and don't just give the answer of, you know, because I said so. Uh, we always know from like family situations that doesn't always work out well. Give actual business reasons why you want to achieve specific things. Take employee recommendations and feedback seriously because they're going to give you feedback on what they need to succeed, which at the end of the day will help you as the business owners. So make sure you 
do have a way to facilitate their feedback and you provide feedback back about those those answers or those questions that they have. Uh, customer feedback is always important, especially if you're doing external users or guest users. Um, and ways to, you know, make it fun. OK, people want to don't just have a, a platform to just do things, but they want to be engaged by it. Things that you can do such as hackathons um, or games or, you know, tournaments within your organization not only help drive innovation and creativity, but they also are an opportunity to gain new ideas of how teams can be used within your organization to help solve a uh, line of business problems and processes. Okay. And from an individual, I don't know about you, but when I go to work every day, I want to get stuff done, right? I want to have the tools I need to be empowered to do my job. I want to be able to go ahead and make sure that I have the right morale, uh, that I'm happy when I come to work. I I really, you know, someone's going to, you know, smite me for this, but, you know, I hate going to work one day and finding out that, like, gosh, my internet is just not working and it takes this application so low to, you know, long to load that I, I can't get anything done. And then I just get frustrated. Uh, we want to keep people happy. We want to give them tools to succeed. And we want to give them the ability to think of ideas of new ways the tools can be used. So from an individual standpoint, I want to feel empowered and engaged in not only the tools, but in the way that I'm able to use them to help solve my business processes. OK. And tangible, right? Executives care about this. Whenever you're rolling out a new technology, how does it benefit the organization in a tangible way at the end of the day? So some of these tangible things you can think about is, you know, are, am I providing a faster service to my clients? Um, is it helping reduce the number of incident reports that are going through the help desk because people can find things or they can chat, they can find stuff? Uh, what are the cost savings? Is it because, hey, I don't have to pay for Skype for Business on-premises servers anymore, or I'm not paying for GoToMeeting or Zoom or another application. This is already licensed, so I'm getting an actual physical, tangible cost savings from implementing Teams in my organization. Um, are you using it to help generate revenue through like new marketing campaigns or ideas? Um, did it simplify any kind of processes for me by doing it? And can I get rid of some of my old systems um, that I have? What can this replace? place. Um, lots of potential options here to kind of help people, you know, get through it. So some organizations, well, I'm not going to say some, pretty much every organization out there has had to go through this within the last couple months. You know, good timing, right? So remote workers. I myself am a remote worker. I've been a remote worker for the last probably five or six years of my career. So when all these changes happened, it wasn't new to me. I had already figured out those processes. But a lot of companies aren't there. And it's a very difficult thing when you've been going into an office for years to all of a sudden not have support in the same way that you were used to or have to adjust your world to working in new ways that are possible, um, including rolling out teams sometimes in a very fast manner, okay? One of the things I recommend is always trying to call from an approved Teams device. You'll notice I have my headset on. My headset is actually an approved device. And the reasons for this is it helps the clarity of the call. It can make sure that you don't have all the interference from, you know, outside noise and distractions. Um, for instance, I have a very large gray cat at my feet that I'm sure would be meowing in about five seconds to come say hi to all of you. Um, and I wouldn't want that being heard over, um, you know, over the org. And you want to make sure that the devices are supported to be able to handle Teams and the bandwidth required as well. Use things like Office Pro Plus to be able to co-author your documents in real time. Um, you can do that inside of Teams even on a meeting, um, especially being able to now separate out into a second window um, with that pop-out window capability. Um, being able to work together in the same ways that you would sit next to each other in an office are really valuable to you now if you know how to use them. Make sure to send praise to each other. One of the, the things I found over the years being a remote employee is that I might do a really great job, but when they get like the quarterly meetings together in the office and you know they're giving praise to everybody and you know saying what a great job everyone did, the remote employees are often the people that are kind of missed 
because they're not physically there to be that presence, even though they are driving force in your organization. With everyone being remote everyone's now, um, or at least for the time being, try to give that extra little bit of praise or say good job or give ways to encourage employees in their workloads because trying to change everything really fast right now is is very stressful on a lot of a lot of organizations and a lot of employees and sometimes that encouragement can help someone just get through their day use things like announcements to keep your teams up to date um, on say new things that are coming out or new ways of working or you know hey we're allowed to go back to the office tomorrow uh you know with you know he, here's a link to you know our recommendations for social distancing is an example and empower people to download the app on their phone there is a teams app you also have an office app um, that you can download on both android and um, you know apple devices they will give you a, a great experience no matter what so even if you're on the go and you're not in your office or you're not near your computer you still have access to everything that you need to be successful, including setting up meetings or working on documents if you need to. Okay, an example of co-authoring. Co-authoring differs slightly depending on the um, application that you're in, uh, but usually like in Word as examples, it will actually block out the paragraph that I'm working in so no one else can edit the same paragraph. They'll tell me who else is in the, the document at the same time. It just gives me the ability to have multiple people in there working and uh, going through everything at the same time. Okay. And the last piece we want to cover today, because I know we're running out of time, is our customization capabilities. So sometimes you just need to customize things, not for the sake of customization, but because there's a business need. Uh, so there's a couple different kinds of customizations that you can do. You can create new apps um, that interact with the application itself. Um, or connectors to other lines of business applications. You can create different bots, such as a Q&A bot or a chat bot or you know, other bots for your line of business. You can create new templates for Teams if you need, as well as extending the capabilities using Azure um, to be able to you know, create a whole new world, um, especially with like Microsoft Graph. So a little bit about it is you know, some of the extensibility, the scope is either gonna be for a team or it's gonna be personal. So you have to understand what you want your customization to be scoped to and the type of capabilities that it can do, whether it's messaging or taps or notifications or bots or whatever you want it to do. Um, you know, side loading is you know, being able to bring that, add that app into the, um, uh, in through your teams um, itself. Um, you can also be, you know, through the, uh, I don't know why my brain is checking, but okay. Anyway, or you can download it from the app store or your company store if, if you had one. So uh, you can use all three to be able to bring your apps into your organization. A couple examples of some of them that we have. This first one is a bot example, and the bot example allows us to create things that you know you would app you know mention a bot, um, and it'll come out and say, "Hey, I want to do a new task," and it'll take you through being able to do that that task within the bot itself. Some of the great bots that are out there right now are things like Q&A bots for simple, basic, standardized questions that users might have within your organization. Second one is things like adaptive cards. Um, and adaptive cards, you know, these are definitely developer scenarios. Developers need to create these, but being able to create something like this where, you know, hey, it's, you know, I've got a specific meeting that needs to take place um, or specific task that's happening. Do I need to move this? Do I need to view it in another area or set due dates? Different options on how you want to be able to work with content directly within um, an adaptive card kind of feature. Third one is the messaging extension. So where messaging extensions come in is when you, you know, go over to your three dots and you have some extra options, you could create options that come in here. In this case, things like, you know, a new work item. New work item is not an out of the box capability. That is a custom functionality that creates a specific line of business process um, that could be based around it. Things like that uh, could be used if you're using Teams as a help desk 
support. Maybe you needed to have things come over to teams to have a conversation around a ticket, and then you needed to take that information and push it back out to maybe service now. Those are examples of things that you can do with some of the messaging bots. And our last one that we have is our command bar extensions. So command bar extensions come from the top, up where you would have your search box. And this could be anything from like, hey, call so-and-so or at mention or, you know, who is on call. It's ways for you to guys to be able to think about standardized things that you can automatically create directly from the search bar and command bar up at the top versus having to go through another, click on something that takes you to an external application. You can do it right from within Teams. So those are the four primary customizations that you are going to see. With that, I know we have about five minutes left, so I will see if there's any questions that you guys might have. Anyone's moderating. <laughs> Let's take a look. No questions? Okay. Well, if there's no questions, then just a couple quick announcements I want to make sure you guys have is that we are having a raffle um, for this conference. So even though we are remote, we are still giving you all the best things that are available. So please make sure that you go to uh, the bit.ly link on the uh, on the screen. It will help you to uh, be able to qualify for the new Oculus Quest. Um, and you know, hopefully you guys will all win. So go ahead, screenshot that really quick. I'll give you a moment. And the last thing we want to do is thank all of our sponsors for today. So thank you to Proficient and, and AppPoint and Affirma and TyGraph and all of the companies who help make these conferences um, for us. Um, without their support, we would not be able to provide you guys content and help out the community. So please thank them. Um, if you're ever interested in sponsoring a conference later, there are lots of opportunities and we always welcome the support in the community. So with that, I will wish you guys a great rest of the conference and thank you guys so much for coming to my session today.